This is a KSBS Vote 2020 election special. A debate featuring candidates for Spokane County Commissioner. Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Christy Gorenson. KSPS is pleased to bring you this debate featuring the candidates running for Spokane County Commissioner in District 1. District 1 encompasses the northern third of the county and includes Deer Park, Mead and Nine Mile Falls. Only district residents voted in the primary, but all county voters will have a say in the November election. Let me introduce the candidates to you. Josh Kearns is the incumbent commissioner seeking his second term in office. He lives in Mead. Ted Cummings is a Kaiser Aluminum employee and raises cattle and grows hay on a small ranch in Chatteroy. Welcome to you both. Thank you. For this debate, the candidates will answer questions from two Spokane journalists. Rebecca White is a reporter for the Spokesman Review. And sitting six feet away from Rebecca is Daniel Walters, reporter for The Inlander. Before I begin, I want to go over a few of the debate rules for our viewers. These rules were agreed to by the candidates. The panel will ask the same question to all of the, all candidates, or they can direct the question to just one. The panelist may request a follow-up to an answer. Candidates will have one minute for answers. Candidates will be allowed two rebuttals for the entire debate. Rebuttal length will be limited to 30 seconds. So let's begin. A coin flip earlier determined that, uh, Mr. Cummings, you will take the first question, and that'll come from Daniel. Yeah, I wanted to ask about um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Looking back, is there anything that the is Spokane County, particularly, should have done differently in addressing the pandemic? Uh, I think they should have had a cohesive message uh, coming out of the gate. We had a, a person on the health board come out and question uh, whether mask usage was necessary or value added. He proposed using hydroxychloroquine for treatment, um, pretty much played down the threat and the danger of the, the pandemic. I think that's uh, what we could have done better. We could have come out in a unified voice and said, you know, we're going to follow the science on this and we're, we're going to make sure that uh, we support it. We want you to know that we support it. And instead, there was a lot of infighting. Well, we should open up sooner or this or that. I, I thought that was counterproductive, and I, and I thought it, it was a disservice to the, the people in Spokane County. So I think that's critical in this time of need. We need leadership that comes out forcefully, and I think we've seen it in our governor. And I think the county should emulate that, have a unified voice, and follow the science. All right. Thank you, Mr. Kearns. So um, the, the county's response was, was very well done. Um, from from the, the, the time that we declared our, our state of emergency, we immediately stood up our emergency operations center, uh, which was operated by the county's Department of Emergency Management. We began daily briefings uh, that were that were run by the uh, Spokane County Sheriff, Ozzie Knezovich, as well as, as, well as our regional health, uh, health director, uh, Dr. Bob Lutz. Uh, we set up committees uh, to, uh, w committee working groups to um, figure out things such as PPE acquisition, testing capacity, child care, uh, business recovery. Uh, we've had a very unified message. Those, um, the, those briefings uh, were many times followed by uh, press conferences that would have a representative from the county commissioners, our mayors, city council members, stressing the importance of following local, state, and national guidelines uh, to keep our community safe. All right, thank you. Mr. Kearns, you'll take this next question from Rebecca. So in 2017, Spokane County Commissioners voted to reduce funding by about $400,000 for the Spokane Regional Health District. In 2021, the health district's expenses are likely going to increase as they continue to address the pandemic. How should the health district be funded in the future and should the county provide more funding? Yeah, so um, that, that, that budget that you're referencing uh, was actually a budget that I voted no on. I, I did not support that, that budget. Um, currently, the, the health district receives uh, roughly $2 million from the county. Um, that's uh, about $200,000 that's mandated by state law that goes to uh, TB, uh, the TB program run by the health districts, and then $1.8 million that goes to, uh, to, to operate in, in the general fund of the, of the health district. Um, 
One, one common misperce misperception is that uh, people view the, uh, the health district as a county department, but it is actually not. It is its own entity, its own standalone entity, uh, but the county is the only local jurisdiction that provides any funding to the health district. And when you look at the makeup of the board, there are three commissioners, there are three representatives from the city of Spokane, two from the, the Spokane Valley, a small city's representatives uh, as well, but no cities help fund that organization, but they have a say in the operations as well. I think all of us should share in supporting that organization. All right, thank you, Mr. Cummings. Well, I think uh, the pandemic was a perfect example of where we should invest our money and public health is a, is a place that we should prioritize. Um, I, I get that uh, Josh had a limited role in that decision and as he's pointed out, there's problems with it, but I fully support funding that fully, going to those boards, saying what do you need from us, from the county, what improvements do we need to make to make this operation uh, more uh, valuable to the citizens of Spokane County and to continue, continue to have discussions about pulling those people in and saying, hey, you need to contribute if you wanna be on this and, and really revitalize uh, our, our health board. All right, thank you. Mr. Cummings, you'll take this next question. This spring, Spokane County received $91 million in CARES Act funding from the federal government to address costs associated with the pandemic. Has that money been spent well? And if the federal government extended the deadline to 2021, what issue would you spend any additional federal funds on? Um, so I, I think uh, there's a lot of things that we can do. And I, it's, an, it's a situation that I have not gotten a lot of feedback. If I was a county commissioner where I would be focused on is, is the rent aspect of it, keeping people in, either in their homes or uh, helping them with mortgages, especially, and the landlords too. So whatever we can do to, to invest in that, I think that would be my, my primary care. Uh, it's good to hear that we've put money in PPE, but I think there's a, there's a limited payback on that. Uh, there's absolutely a certain amount that's necessary, but I think keeping people in homes, supporting small businesses and keeping those jobs uh, alive and afloat is, is job one. And I think we're gonna have to spend a lot of money to get through this. Um, and it's gonna take uh, investing and working together with the state and the federal government to create jobs, to support those people with small businesses and keep people working so we can keep them in their homes. Mr. Cruz? Uh, I'm extremely, extremely proud in the way that we've spent the, those $91 million. We, we've, we've expended about half of the money uh, to date. Um, so, some of the things that, that we prioritized were uh, small business recovery. We were able to provide uh, grants for many of our small businesses and nonprofits that are struggling during this uncertain time. Uh, we also uh, dedicated uh, about $6.5 million to Second Harvest Food Bank, uh, which will also help fill our local neighborhood pantries because nobody in this community should go hungry during this pandemic. Um, we've, we've also uh, supported uh, our local school districts by providing uh, over $5 million so they can uh, uh, continue to educate our children because no, ch no child should fall behind uh, because of this pandemic as well. Uh, and most, most importantly, we've provided $8 million to the Spokane Regional Health District so that they can cover their duties um, as far as their, um, th their uh, aspect of combating this coronavirus and keeping it under control as much as possible. Thank you. Mr. Kearns, you'll take this next question. So over the last several years, criminal justice reform has been a huge um, discussion that has happened at the county. And so this spring, uh, a new jail was again discussed before the pandemic. Uh, you know, in the next year or in the future, should we have a new jail? And if yes, what should it look like? Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, I think you know b because of the, uh, the the difficulty that we're in in this economy, um, I I don't see a, a, a jail proposal going before before voters uh, in the near future. Um, I, I can tell you right now there there are deficiencies in the operations of our existing facility. It's a facility that's as old as I am. From the day it opened, it, it's been open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And the people that are inside it don't want to be there. So they don't treat it very well. There's a lot of wear and tear on that facility. Um, 
As, as far as size, uh, we have far exceeded what the original capacity of that building was when it was constructed. Um, I would like to see a, a facility in the future that would allow us to bring down the operational expenses uh, of the jail. I would also like to see a facility that would allow us to consolidate our two facilities and be able to offer additional, tr uh, additional skills, additional training, additional programming that can help reduce recidivism for the, the individuals that are inside the jail. Mr. Cummings? So I, I'm glad to hear Mr. Kern say that. I, I don't think spending money on a new jail is a, the best use of our money. Um, I believe that the facility needs to be efficient and safe. It needs to protect the people that work in there as well as the people that are, are housed in that facility. That would be my first uh, priority to, to look at. Well, what are the options here? What can we do and make a decision based on that? I, I totally support uh, uh, increasing our funding to mental health and to apprentice programs and to, and to rehabilitation and diversion programs that keep people from going down this path. And I think it all comes back to uh, economic justice. When people don't have jobs, when people don't have hope, when people don't have a path forward, they make bad choices. And I think the system forces them into that. And that's what we need to be talking about. Not new jails and more law enforcement. We need to talk about why we're putting people in, in prison and in jails in the first place. And that's what I want to focus on. All right, thank you, Mr. Cummings. You'll take this next question from Daniel. Yeah, um, Mr. Cummings, you've accused, uh, this is for both uh, people, but uh, Mr. Cummings, you've accused your former uh, 2018 opponent, outgoing Representative Matt Shea, of favoring sedition and fascism. Well, Commissioner Kearns has previously appeared on Shea's podcast, and after an independent investigator accused Representative Shea of having planned and participated in the armed anti-government Oregon Wildlife Refuge standoff, he declined to join a chorus of calls for his resignation. What explains your differences of opinions on this issue, and to what degree do you see your job as calling out other elected officials for their words or actions when you may object to them? Great question, Daniel. It's what an uh, elected official needs to do. You, you, when you see a wrong, you have an obligation, a moral and, and I don't want to say illegal, but just a righteous obligation to confront it wherever you find it. And I'm so proud of my, my race in 2018. And uh, the fact that people haven't come out and condemned that, and, and we have this Proud Boy issue now, that needs to be condemned. I, I wrote a letter to the editor about uh, armed militias, which are, we're a big proponent of Matt Shays, that he wants to have armed, he's got 70 of them apparently. When we have armed people on our street, that endangers the public health. That sends the wrong message about our community, and I am totally do everything I can to see that that stops. Armed people in our parks while kids are playing soccer is, an, is abhorrent and it should never happen. Not in this county. Not, not if I can do anything about it. So I, I, I think you have an obligation to confront hate and anything that's wrong wherever you encounter it. Thank you. Mr. Kearns. Yeah. Um, you know, I... Do, do I agree with everything that Matt Shea has done and the things that he was accused of? No, I don't. I was not a part of those uh, things. You know, when if you read through those reports, my name was nowhere near them. I was not a part of that. Um, you know, as, as far as asking another elected official to resign from office, uh, I don't think that's my place to do. Um, you, you've never seen me attack another elected official. Uh, in my time as a county commissioner. Uh, you, you can go through and look at quotes. You can look at my Facebook. You know, m many of these elected officials at the state level, I need to go to them and ask for their support on legislation that benefits the county. I need to ask for their support for capital budget requests. If I cannot keep a working relationship with these elected officials, that's a direct uh, disadvantage to the people that I represent in this county. I, I, I do not support hate groups as well. I do not support uh, violence in our streets. You know, I, I, I have worked hard to make this a welcoming community and the best place for everyone to live, work, and raise a family. Right, you have 30 seconds. I think that rings hollow. Uh, if you won't come out and confront uh, someone that's doing so egregious, uh, that reflects on our community. I think you have an obligation to engage that person. And, and whether you're effective or not, that's, that's the road that we've gone down that led to ruin. We have to have principle. We have to have integrity, regardless of the cost, or we end up where we are today, where, where words mean nothing. So uh, you know what? Uh, the, there's a time and a place to draw a line, and this is one of them. When we have people in our community that feel threatened by our representatives, that's outrageous and it needs to stop. I'll use one of my 
well. All right. Um, you know, the, whether, whether you agree with what uh, Representative Shea is accused of doing or not, he is elected by the people of the 4th Legislative District. I did not call for his resignation. I did not hear my opponent calling for Representative Tim Ormsby's resignation when he was accused of drunk driving where he flipped his car into somebody's front yard in Olympia while texting. You know, it is about, it is about uh, values, it is about standing up for what you believe in, but I'm sorry when you sit there and say that it doesn't matter how effective you are for your constituents, that's just false. All right, thank you both. I'd like to play again if I could. You may, this is your last so, rebuttal. So you, you don't see a difference between a, a drunk driving, someone that made a mistake that could happen to me or anyone else, and someone actively fomenting sedition, planning to bash a woman's head into a Jersey bear? You're okay with that? I'm shocked by that, Josh. That is, that's completely outrageous. There, there is no place for that. And that's what you're elected to do, to lead. And if it means calling out another person, you have a duty to do that if you really want to serve your people. Not once did I say I support what was in the, what, that he was accused of doing. I believe I specifically said I do not support the things that Representative Shea was accused of. I do not support terrorism. I do not support domestic terrorism. I do not support hate. I do not support violence in our streets. I have stood strong at being a unifying voice within our community, and I have represented our community quite well for the last four years, and I've never been accused of, of any of the things that you are trying to tie me to. All right, you've both used your uh, final rebuttals. Let's uh, move on. Clarify real quick, uh, Representative Shade was not the one who made that statement about uh, bashing the woman's head in. Uh, it was a group that he was a part of. Somebody else of one of his allies did did say that, but just to be, be clear, that wasn't Representative Shea in that Thank point. Thank you for clarifying that. Right. So we're going to go, uh, Mr. Kearns, you'll take this next question from Rebecca. Yeah, and so this is a question for just uh, Josh Kearns. So in 2018, you voted to require unions uh, that represent county employees to negotiate in public, um, though in that same year, there was kind of an ongoing lawsuit. Should the county be enforcing that requirement right now, or should it wait until that lawsuit is resolved. I, I'm a huge proponent of transparency in government. Um, I, that, that, that resolution that we passed is, is something that allows for uh, the taxpayers to see how their tax dollars are, use it, are being used and being bargained with. Um, it, it's also proven to be wildly popular in our community. About a year after we adopted it, the city of Spokane adopted into their city charter uh, an amendment that was almost identical to what we passed. And it, and it passed by voters of over 76%. It's wildly popular because it allows the public to see how their tax dollars are being bargained with. It allows the media to, to see it as well and report on it. And it also allows rank and file union members to be in there to see how their union is bargaining on their behalf. You know, my, my opponent supports uh, sort of the, the, the strategy where some, these sort of things should be done in dark back rooms uh, with no eyes on them. You know, and, and quite frankly, that's just wrong. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cummings, you have a chance to respond. Yeah, so everything Mr. Kern said is part of the Freedom Foundation propaganda. And, and this, is one of the, this is the reason why I jumped into this race when no one else had filed on Friday. Is he is a, it's, it's one thing that he's not going to stand up and, and protect segments of his community against a domestic terrorist. But this is, again, another attack on a, on a segment of his community, the, the people that have union jobs. This is, this is the bulk of our middle class. And to say that, that uh, we sit in dark rooms and negotiate contracts is patently false. It, it's, it's a way to get things done efficiently. What comes out of those rooms is in a contract, and that's available for everyone to see, members, the community, everyone. But if you have a, a football arena around you while you're trying to have discussions, you're not going to explore things thoroughly. You're not going to bring up suggestions. You're not going to talk. This is an ongoing attack against working people, destroying the middle class, and I'm, I'm totally opposed to it. The unions have done so much good in this country, and this is a false narrative. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Cummings, you'll take this next question from yeah, Daniel. Yeah, this is uh, specifically for, for Mr. Cummings. Spokane County hasn't elected a, a Democrat to the Board of County Commissioners for over a decade. It's a, a fairly Republican county. To county voters who may have voted Republican in the past, why should they vote for a Democrat this year? To me, this isn't about Democrats or Republicans. 
This is about being a good human being. And, and to me, if, you, if you're on a party that wants to take rights away from people, to vilify people for their income, to take away their ability to bargain a contract, to keep them in poverty, to use poverty as a business model uh, versus someone that wants to lift everyone up, that wants to promote affordable housing, wants to work on the environment, wants to bring everyone up. That's a simple binary choice. You can choose to be against people or you can choose to be for people, and that's what this is. I get Spokane is red. I get it's Republican. But that's all the more reason to every year field a candidate that comes out and speaks for the people and speaks the truth and refutes propaganda and, and misstatements and misleading narratives that are designed to keep people poor, designed to keep people in their place and stop them from sharing in the American dream. Thank you. Mr. Kearns? Uh, I think, I think the, the reason why um, you know, we, we continue to see Republicans elected is because they've been quite successful at promoting job growth uh, and public safety. Th those are two things that are extremely important to this community. In my time on the county commission, I've pushed hard for job growth through our public development authorities. We've brought thousands of new jobs to this region. Um, and more on its way, you know, with the construction of the Amazon Fulfillment Center uh, to Mullen Technology that's going to be breaking ground. We have a new commerce park that's going to be built in our Northeast Public Development Authority. You know, we have a record of results uh, and accomplishments. You know, all, all you have to do is look at the primary results in our race. I received 64% of the vote. That's more than any county commissioner candidate in Spokane County has ever received in a primary since we've gone to the top two primary system in Washington State. And it's because I have delivered for my constituents and I've kept the promises I made when I first ran for this office. All right, Rebecca has the next question for Mr. Kearns. Okay, and then this, is, this is a, will be a question for both of you. Um, but should Spokane expand its urban growth boundaries, the places where dense housing development is allowed? And if so, where and how far? Uh, I do believe that uh, th that we need to ex expand our urban growth area. Um, you know, th this is something that, that's laid out in the uh, Growth Management Act. Unfortunately, we are not allowed to push that boundary out until uh, at the earliest 2025 uh, due to a lawsuit uh, that, that the county was involved in prior to my becoming a commissioner. But one of the driving forces um, to the, the high uh, housing prices right now is the lack of supply. Uh, you know, if it, when you artificially create um, a boundary or, or, or artificially restrict the supply of land uh, for, for housing, you drive up the value of that land. And then every house that is constructed makes the existing land that's still there more expensive. So you end up with a situation where you have, you have a, uh, a, a house that's been built on an overpriced piece of land, you now have a more expensive home. Uh, so yes, we need more supply, we need more housing stock, we need attainable housing at all levels of, of, of the spectrum and, and, and price. And one of the ways to do that is by having more buildable lands available. All right, thank you. Mr. Cummings. So this is a huge problem in Spokane. I think the average home price, and Josh probably knows the exact number better than me, is around $300,000. Well, how is anyone in the Amazon Fulfillment Center going to afford a $300,000 home. Uh, we need to invest in affordable housing. And, and I think the, the county needs to partner with private interests and, and recruit uh, contractors and small, small contractors, small business to design uh, green homes and build planned communities that have good commutes to their jobs that uh, are, are going to leave a low carbon footprint and are affordable for people working at Walmart and Amazon and Target and all these other these jobs. We, this is a huge crisis and it's only going to get worse. And I'm wondering why have we waited till now to talk about it? Why did we let homes get to a quarter of a million dollars or more in a blue collar town like Spokane? All right, thank you. So this is going to be our last question. Uh, Daniel, you'll have it. And Mr. Cummings, you'll uh, answer first. And we're going to limit the answers to 30 seconds. There is a, uh, because of legislation and now a court decision, they're going to be expanding the number of commissioners in Spokane from, from three to five. And I, my question is, is in, in that case, how should we be electing those commissioners? Should we be electing it countywide or should we be electing it where only the people from these specific um, commissioner districts get a vote in the general election? So my understanding, and I think I agree with it, is it's only going to be in the district. 
And that's designed so that we have an area, maybe it's a low income area, that they can have a representative to work on their unique needs and, and processes. They will have a voice on the commission. And, and I think that's the beauty of this, this plan is it's going to stop a red county it's going to add diversity in. It's going to bring varied opinions, and I think that's healthy, and I think it's needed. Mr. Kearns? Yeah, um, so the, the, the legislation has already determined that, that, that it will make county commissioners run by district only, um, so that there's, there's nothing we can do to change that. Uh, th there certainly is a, a benefit to having commissioners run countywide because they are then that they then represent everybody within the county, you know, because each each corner of our of our county does have different nuances, different issues that impact them, and it does uh, make you take more of a holistic approach to uh, to county government, making sure that you are watching out for every citizen within Spokane County. All right. Is that the right decision? You know, it's, uh, I, I think it definitely has a drawback uh, m moving to district-based voting. Uh, it, it, it does po potentially lend itself to where you, you do have, a, um, y you can maybe develop those uh, I extremes or maybe niche issues that don't have um, countywide uh, relevance that uh, could rise to the top of discussions that otherwise wouldn't. And it also could lend itself to the situation where uh, th there could be three members of, the, of a five-member board that could essentially prevent two other districts from receiving funding for, for roads or law enforcement coverage as well. All right, thank you. That yeah. will be the last question. We're going to have closing statements now. And Mr. Cummings, you'll go first. You have one minute. Thank you. And, and thank you to you bringing this on. I want to say how much I respect and am grateful for everyone involved in the media. I know you guys are taking it hard now, the, the labels of fake news, but a democracy dies in darkness, and that's not my line. And it's so important and so critical, and I have so much respect for what you do, so thank you. This election is about people. It's not about Republicans or Democrats, at least in my mind. It, it disturbs me that I have a, an elected official that wants to take away what I have. He wants to take away my ability to collect a bargain, that doesn't want to stand up and speak up for everyone when he hears someone threatening them. I think it's all about integrity and honesty and decency. We have to put people first. We have to do common sense things. We have to be fiscally responsible. We have to plan. And that, that requires transparency. That requires people putting people first, not corporations and developers. So that's what I want people to take away. I will work for the people. Thank right. you. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Kearns. Uh, thank you to KSPS for organizing tonight's debate. And thank you at home for, for watching. The people of Spokane County deserve a commissioner who will work to protect and grow jobs, will protect your tax dollars, and will prioritize public safety. I am that commissioner. For the last four years, I have been dedicated to making this the best place to live, work, and raise a family. I have a track record at promoting job growth through the work that I have done on our public development authorities. This brought thousands of jobs to our community. I have provided for our sheriff's department and provided for public safety and I have never once voted to raise your property taxes. My opponent tonight has used generalities and misinformation in an attempt to, to, to guide you astray, but all he has succeeded in is showing his lack of understanding of county government. It would be my absolute honor to continue as your county commissioner. I'm Josh Kearns, and I ask you to join me, and together we will continue to get results for Spokane County. Well, that will have to do it for this debate. Our thanks to each of the candidates, as well as to our journalists, Rebecca White and Daniel Walters. If you aren't registered to vote, it's not too late. You have until October 26th to register online or by mail, and you can even register to vote in person until 8 p.m. on Election Day. For all of us at KSPS, thank you for watching.